Hi, everyone. I'm Andrew Gaffney. I'm Editorial Director with Demand Gen Report. Really glad you could join us today. Uh, we've got a great topic. Uh, we're going to be looking at lead scoring, uh, which has been one of the core topics we've covered at Demand Gen Report for over a decade. However, it's gotten uh, re sort of reemerged with new importance uh, among our readers. I think over the past couple of years, as ABM has become such a priority, um, new roles of scoring have emerged there. Uh, but also over the past year or so after the pandemic, I think a lot of our readers have been reaching out to us and asking about bringing up scoring again is, is really a, a new area, new ways of looking at it. They've seen spikes in web traffic, which have been good, uh, a lot more digital engagement, but they're really trying to figure out how much of that uh, traffic and, and, and new eyeballs are, are really aligned with uh, core ICPs and what they should be going after. So in today's session, we're going to be covering lead scoring simplified. Uh, we're going to be looking at uh, how do you can use data AI to focus on your best leads. Um, and we've got some really great uh, thought leadership, great speakers, um, and some examples I think you're going to really get value out of. So let's jump right in. Um, quick reminder, today's session is uh, presented by Demand Gen Report. If you're not already one of our subscribers, we'd love for you to join us. You can do so at demandgenreport.com. You'll get uh, further information, further access to sessions like this, some of the research that we do throughout the year, and a lot of thought leadership articles, news, and coverage of the B2B marketing space. Uh, also, check us out on social media. We've got some great uh, activity on uh, social networks, on LinkedIn, Twitter, so please take advantage of that as well. A uh, quick reminder, our big event was virtual this year. Just a couple of weeks ago, we wrapped up our B2B marketing exchange. This year, we did an online experience and had a ton of great content on topics like today's. So go back and check that out if you missed it. Um, within the platform, some housekeeping I'll cover real quick. You, I want you to, if you could type in questions, the presentation will last for about 40 minutes, uh, but then we want to come back and, and take as many of your questions as we can. So type them in as you, you come to mind. You can do that right within the a Q and A tab. There's also a list of related resources, so you can go take advantage of those um, as you're watching or after. Uh, there's also an area to share feedback that we'd love uh, if you could share any thoughts, questions, feedback you have, and an area to keep an eye on social as well. So, without further ado, I mentioned we've got two great speakers. Let me give you some background. Um, I've had the privilege of working with Kerry Cunningham uh, for for a number of years. I think he's one of the top analysts in the, in the B2B space. Uh, Kerry is VP Principal Analyst at Forrester. Uh, he brings more than 25 years of experience in B2B demand generation management, uh, sp spanning a broad array of industries and markets. He's been a thought leader in the design and implementation of demand marketing processes, technologies, and teams for a wide array of B2B uh, product solutions and services. For more than two decades, spanning the gap between uh, marketing and sales, Kerry has also developed a wealth of expertise in the alignment of marketing and sales. and. Uh, worked really closely on some models around ABM and, and others. So really excited to have Kerry today. Um, Kerry will be joined by Dennis Olkay. Dennis is VP of uh, Product Marketing with Dun & Bradstreet. Um, uh, Dun & Bradstreet, for those of you that aren't aware, is a data provider for 90% of the Fortune 500. Uh, Dennis is a passionate MarTech thought leader, focusing on the role of data in fueling um, Organizational growth strategies. His prior experience includes working for a global sales concert, consulting firm where he trained thousands of sellers on how to better communicate uh, value. Um, so really excited that Dennis is going to be sharing some use cases, some models around using AI and really sort of next-gen um, applications for um, lead scoring. So without further ado, I'm going to turn it over to Kerry to get us started. Thank you, Andrew, and uh, appreciate everybody joining us today. Uh, this is a really uh, interesting topic. It's certainly one that we've been talking about for a long time, uh, and it's changed a lot over the course of the last six or seven years uh, that I've specifically been uh, covering this. So today we're going to look at um, our demand unit waterfall, and we're going to give the context for a lot of the nuts and bolts, uh, how to do things that Dennis is going to be talking about later on. That context is really important and it's changed quite a bit over the last few years. So when I'm done, Dennis is going to come on and essentially he's going to get very uh, practical about how to apply technology and data to understanding which are the best prospects to go after. And then we'll take some uh, questions and, and hopefully have some answers for you. Uh, so first of all, as a piece of context, put this in the back of your head that, that B2B is an ecosystem in which we all live. That's why you're here today. And that ecosystem is mediated by signals. In other words, we know where we are and who we're interacting with and who we ought to interact with and who we want to interact with through signaling. They're largely B2B signals or 
digital signals. And in fact, over the last year, it's almost entirely digital signals. Um, but even those signals that uh, are not digital become digital when they get into our systems like marketing automation and Salesforce automation. So it signals everywhere we look. And the question is, what do we do with those signals and which ones matter? Now, we started working on this question of which ones matter a few years ago when we introduced the demand unit waterfall. But lately when we talk about it, what we really talk about are uh, these things we call the seven must do's, which are literally what you must do to identify, attract, engage, and, and prioritize and convert opportunities. And it's really all about opportunities. So the reason we bring this up now is that what we're gonna be talking about is how we identify which of the potential opportunities we want to forward through our revenue engines and which people that we see coming to our website or events and filling out forms, which of those people actually belong to an opportunity that we could turn into revenue somehow, because that's really what we're trying to do. So that's what we're gonna look at. We're not gonna go through each of the stages in detail at the minute, but it starts off by understanding which are the potential opportunities and why that's really critical is because when somebody comes to our website, what we need to know, the first and most important thing we need to know is does that person come from an organization that could buy something from us? Because if they don't, we don't care. Um, if they do, then we want to know what they're up to. Right? And when we want to know what they're up to, it's what are they interested in? How interested are they? And then crucially, the thing that, that most organizations are not yet but should be focusing on is did they bring friends? So if your uh, lead that came to your website is by him or herself, uh, probably that person is not going to be buying something from you immediately. But if there are two or three other people, or if you can see intent data that says that that person has some friends who came to the website with them, the chances are that person is part of an active buying group and represents a good opportunity for you. That's what we want to know at the top. Uh, is this person from an, from an organization that could buy something from you? That Do they appear to actually be in market? And then are there other members of that buying group or buying committee that we could identify as well? How do we do that and make sure that we don't miss a lot? And what I mean by miss a lot is this. So here's a very simplified version of the waterfall. It starts with inquiries on the top. You have automation that qualifies them. You have a telequal team. You have a sales team. You could think of each of the stages that your leads pass through as a filter. And the filter is going to let through some things, and it's going to filter out some other things. How it does that job of filtering things out and leaving things in is the subject of lead scoring, and it's really what this is all about. Now, the reality is that the filters filter out almost everything. So when we look at just the inquiries getting to a sales-ready stage, that is usually around 2 3%, something like that. And then if you go further all the way down to closed one, the likelihood of a lead at the top going all the way down to closed one is less than 1% for almost all of you. So the question is, are our filters filtering out the right ones and are they leaving in the right ones? And so we can look at this in kind of a, a four box. And the four box would be this, that there's a reality associated with each one of those leads. Either that lead is from an organization that has an active buying process or could, or it isn't, right? So that's the reality. It's either a buyer or it's not. And then your filters are going to make a decision. Your filters are going to decide whether the filters think it's a buyer or not. The filters are your scoring. The filters are your tele-team, like we just saw. So they're going to make a decision about whether they think it's a buyer or not. Now, in the, in the best case, the filter would say, yes, I think that's a buyer. And then that would match the reality that that individual is from a buying committee and could make a decision to purchase something from them. It is also a correct and an accurate decision if the person is not part of a buying group, is not a buyer, and your filters identify that, and the earlier they identify that, the better it is, the less resource you'll spend on that person. Now, the reason it's so important to understand that that's a correct decision is because that's the right decision 90% of the time. So we want to make sure that we get that right. Now, a false decision or a wrong decision is if the buyer is not really a buyer, but your filter says it is, right? So the classic case of uh, a lead being scored highly, getting passed off to the uh, SDR team or the sales team, but it's not really a buyer. That's a false positive. The other bad answer is a false negative. And that's when, of course, our, our lead does not make it through our filters 
um, let's say it goes to the teleteam, but the teleteam either never reaches out or never gets a hold of that prospect. Um, and so even though that person is part of a buying process, they don't make it through your filter. They don't get to sales. You don't get to compete for that business. All right, now these two bad outcomes are, they seem like they might be equal. And the truth is that they're constantly in flux within our demand gen processes, that we always have some amount of false positives and we have some amount of false negatives, but they are not equivalent. And we need to be super clear about this. So false positives create inefficiencies in your system. You're passing along leads that aren't gonna go anywhere. Sales is gonna complain about that. Your SDR team's gonna complain about that. I think of that as a debilitating chronic disease it's one that you can treat, right? You can adjust scoring uh, and you can do a number of things that we're gonna see in a minute to make that uh, filter, uh, filter out more of those things that are coming through as false positives. Now, this gets a lot of attention in organizations because the people who are getting these false positives complain a lot and they're loud, right? So they make a lot of noise about it. But on the bottom, we have the false negatives. And if you have false negatives in the system, that means that there's a person coming to your website, they're part of a buying group, that group is gonna buy something, and you don't recognize that or you don't do your jobs well enough to pass that through your process, and so you don't get to compete for that business. And I would maintain that is a much, much bigger problem. That is a problem that's gonna end up with your competitors getting business, but you not getting to compete for it and you won't know what's happening, right? You may see bad conversion rates, but you won't know that your competitors are actually getting business you could have had, right? So this is a very, very deadly disease for a revenue engine. And when we have this disease, we need to get it fixed. And so the reason that uh, I talk about this so extensively is that our current processes, if you're just doing lead scoring and marketing automation, it is not good enough to solve these problems effectively. All right, so how do you do it? Well, you go back to signaling. So I mentioned signaling at the very beginning. We've talked a lot about signaling over the last uh, year or so at Forrester. And here's a way we think of it at a high level. So we, we know that there are entities that we care about. There are accounts, buying centers, buying groups, or buying committees, you may call them. And then there are individuals who make up those buying group buying committees. For each of these entities, there are three kinds of signals. There are fit signals. Dennis is gonna talk a lot about fit signals in a little bit, but these are extremely important. This tells you, do I care about the rest of the signals I might be getting? Because if this person and this account is not a good fit, I don't really care, uh, or I care a lot less. Current state. So current state is one that you may not be aware of, but it's uh, really a subset you could think of as a fit signal. But what's important about a current state signal is it's a signal that is dynamic. It changes frequently. And so we think about the installed technology account. Here's what's going on inside that account right now. Here's the technologies that they have. Maybe here's some that are for end of contract. Um, and that puts that prospect in a current state where they could buy something. Now, COVID-19 has caused current state changes for almost every organization on the planet. Right? For some, it's made them prospects for certain kinds of solutions, and for others, it's taken them out of being the current in a current state for being a prospect. So these are signals that are really critical to understanding whether that organization and that individual are likely to be or able to be in market at any given set of any given time. So we've got the the fit of the account. We've got whether we think right now is a good time, and then we've got a set of signals that tell us, is there any evidence that they're actually in market? Are they looking around? Are they demonstrating interest? Virtually everything we talk about as an intent signal today is really an interest signal. We don't know what the intent of that buyer is, and the data suggests that the intent is not that they're gonna buy something. Because most intent signals do not result in a purchase, um, we really should be calling these things interest signals. We know that somebody's demonstrating some interest in something. That's all we know at first. Now, if you have a good fit and you have a current state that suggests they should be in market for something right now, and you see an interest signal, now we can start to think about those interest signals as intent. When those two things combine, yeah, that's a that's probably a pretty good signal. We really ought to be paying attention to those interest signals, and it's really important that we do. All right, so there are a few different uh, varieties of, of where these signals come from. 
And this is going to be really important as Dennis goes through his talk about the kinds of signals uh, that DMB offers. It's going to be really important to be thinking about this. So we categorize some signals as directed signals, and that means that that signal literally is directed at you. So every form on your website is a source of directed signal. What's really important about that, and again, Dennis is going to touch on this, is that you have control over what that signal is, right? So if you put up a form on your website, the, the contents of that form, what you allow into the fields and the, and the questions you ask of prospects, determines how good that signal is and how much of it you're going to get. So what we want our clients to do is really think deeply about and engineer these directed signals. Every, virtually every delivery mechanism uh, that you have, that every email that you send, every landing page, uh, every ad, has the ability to collect some signals from a buyer. We want you to engineer that signal to give you a signal that's going to be meaningful and helpful for determining whether this is really a buyer or really not, for tuning those filters. So that's super important. You have control over those. You need to be really thoughtful about that. Uh, again, Dennis is going to show a little bit about how to do that. Uh, the next set of signals is what we call detected. Uh, these are signals that are not directed at you, but they are being detected by somebody or something, and you can acquire them, right? So mostly kind of third-party signals is what we think about here, but virtually all of third-party intent signals are detected signals you're acquiring from somebody else. Um, the current state signals we talked about, so if you're uh, collecting data about what or or say DMV is collecting data about whether a company is hiring or not, or whether their uh, credit rating is going up or down, or whether they're growing or shrinking their financial reports. Those are all current state signals that are being detected by somebody. So your job as a marketer, as a demand marketer in particular, is to understand what kinds of signals you need to have to understand whether your prospects are really in market and to figure out how to acquire them. All right, so these are not ones you're going to create yourself for the most part, but they're ones that you do have to be creative about going out to acquire. And then the third category here is derive. Uh, and virtually everything that's interesting that you're going to look at uh, and put into uh, a model is a derived signal. A derived signal is a score uh, in some cases. In other cases, it's a categorization. So if I take two pieces of data, two signals, and I combine them in some way, either mathematically or I just put them together, um, that's a derived signal. So I got a lead score. That's a derived signal. Uh, it's a signal that doesn't exist until I do that math. Right? So those derived scores are also very important because you should engineer them and you can engineer them. Right? They, they need to be engineered to tell you what you need to know about a prospect and to accurately distinguish between the prospects that are really buyers and the ones that are not. All right, so that's the, the set of signals that I think you'll see a lot uh, in what Dennis talks about in a few minutes about why it's so important to have a variety of signals and how to use that variety of signals together to best identify which prospects are the ones that you ought to be paying attention. Last thing that um, I want to talk about is rethinking the approach to understanding what a buyer really is. So I just talked about uh, the, the different kinds of signals that are available to us. But if you took all of that and you went off and you applied it just to one person, one individual lead at a time, you still wouldn't really advance very far. We have at our disposal today, everybody has all of the things that are in this kind of radar looking thing on the screen right now. But we only pay attention to the stuff that's right at the dead center of it today. So we pay attention to individuals who hit a lead score. But when, whenever we ask our clients to look in their marketing automation data uh, and ask the question, if I got an MQL from this account, did I have anybody else from that account in my data at the same time? In other words, did that person have some friends, some other buying group members who were also looking at our content at the same time? The answer is almost always yes, if that MQL that you had is going to end up becoming an opportunity pipeline revenue, right? So if that individual is part of an active buying group that's going to go somewhere, it's very unlikely that they're going to be the only person who's on your website. And if that's true, you have to figure that out. You have to be able to see that. Uh, and so understanding whether there are other people who are inquiries who filled out forms, extremely important, extremely important buying signal. 
Understanding whether you have anonymous website visitors, also extremely important. I've been talking about this for a while, but if you're a marketing or demand gen leader, the data suggests that 95 to 98% of the responses to your marketing are anonymous traffic on your website, right? That's about what your form fill conversion rates are. Everything else is anonymous. So what are you going to do about it? You're certainly, you can't, you can't say, well, I don't care about the 95 people who visited my website who didn't fill out a form. You got to do everything in your power to understand legally <laughs> within the rules to understand where those people are coming from. And are they coming from the same organizations as where you have MQLs and where you have other inquiries? So extremely important. And uh, today, everybody still loves intent data, loves to use third-party intent data. We think using third-party intent data is smart and it's the right thing to do. But here's a context. The people on your website or anonymously are the third-party intent that your competitors are buying, right? M among other things. So you've got to do something with them as well. Next, the third-party intent signals. Really important, we don't like them for handing off an account to a sales rep. Here's a, an account with some intent signals, go have at it. That doesn't work very well, but what it does, what does work well is if you use that third-party intent to focus your digital spend, get people inside that account who are demonstrating interest anonymously to come to your website and fill out forms. Ideally, that's what they'll do, or chat with uh, reps, or whatever it might be. All right, so we want to use all of these signals, and we want to use them together. That's like the most powerful use of any of these signals is to put them together so that you have a complete set of evidence about which prospects are in market. You, you minimize the number of false positives you deliver, but also minimize the number of false negatives that you leave out. And the only way to do that is to use this wide set of signals that's available to you. And uh, which, fortunately for us, Dennis is going to talk about right now. Thank you very much, Kerry, for that overview. So when it comes to um, the B2B signaling ecosystem, there are three key trends that we're seeing. Uh, they're accelerating the need to use these signals to improve lead conversion performance. So first, um, remote work being the new normal, right? So we're seeing digital transformation across many organizations and ultimately the digitization of the B2B buyer journey is fueling this change. Uh, we also know that buyers are preferring you know, lower friction in their journey. But again, this is sort of conflicting with our ability, right, as uh, marketers and sales ops professionals to collect as much information and signals, as Carrie called it, right, uh, to score leads accurately. So just wanted to cover a couple of slides to set, set sort of the, the context for some of the solutions that I'm going to be recommending um, as a best practice here. But um, you'll see here a McKinsey survey during the pandemic, again, showing digital enabled sales interactions. Um, being twice as important as pre-pandemic levels. This again reinforces the importance of creating a seamless digital buying journey while also collecting the right signals uh, that allow you to accurately score and route leads to your sales teams. Um, the same McKinsey survey shows the dramatic increase in the preference for self-serve interactions uh, during the research phase. And you'll see that on the screen uh, that accounting about 65%. And that has only accelerated uh, by the unforeseen events that we had um, last year. So the issue um, we all know is that not all leads are created equal, right? And new factors uh, are impacting the value of leads that are in your marketing automation systems. Uh, many of you might already be using fit criteria, uh, such as industry and size uh, in your lead scoring and your marketing automation, uh, but incorporating intent, technographic, and risk criteria can also help you prioritize leads uh, for sales or SDR follow-up. And I think this is where AI and automation can come into play to help supplement what you're already doing in your marketing automation platform by finding pockets of high value audiences that match this criteria from additional signals uh, that data aggregators are collecting, right? So this can be an additive solution to what you're doing. Um, so again, let's start with sort of the first uh, common challenge that we see uh, in the marketplace. You know, uh, Kerry alluded to this just a moment ago, uh, but many of us uh, encounter some issues at the point of conversion on a form itself, right, on your, on your landing pages. Typical challenges include understanding uh, the fit with your ideal customer profile based on the information that you're requesting on the form. Uh, you may receive inconsistent or inaccurate uh, lead information on the form itself, which again hurts you 
when you're doing scoring and routing to your sales professionals. Um, and finally, you may not even be capturing the lead due to form abandonment, right? So all the people that are visiting these form pages, that's a signal in and of itself, right? That they actually visited the page, but perhaps found it too daunting or didn't have time or didn't want to be you know, bothered in a, in a follow-up sequence. So this again can be, uh, can be a challenge because typical lead form conversion rates for B2B can range from anywhere from two to 10%, depending on your industry and focus. Um, so a solution here is to use a form augmentation tool that can help unmask audiences that may not already be in your marketing automation platform, in addition to enhancing that lead record with new intelligence and signals um, that can power more effective scoring and routing once you actually get them inside your marketing automation platform, right? And think of all the people that are abandoning this page too, so you can start to capture some of the people that maybe landed here, uh, maybe second guessed and left, uh, that signal you can also collect as, as first party intent data. So again, a benefit of this solution is that you can reduce the number of fields that you actually ask for on a form. Um, and, and again, you can capture information such as location or industry or employees or sales growth, whatever is important for you to understanding um, your leads better. You can capture that actually in hidden form fields when they land on the page. You don't have to explicitly ask for it. Uh, and again, now you can start to increase conversion rates on these forms um, while reducing the number of fields that you actually ask for because you're capturing that by doing reverse IP lookup, reverse cookie lookup. When they're actually you know, typing their information inside the form, we can run APIs that ping our data cloud and enrich that information. So a lot of the key firmographic criteria, you don't have to keep asking over and over again. And again, this improves your conversion rates um, on, your, uh, on your form. So that's, that's one solution, right? Understanding the leads from the start and getting good data populated inside your marketing automation platform could be a good way uh, to get a good quality uh, lead flowing in your marketing automation. When it comes to lead scoring, I just want to start with a basic definition of sort of where AI scoring fits in uh, for the benefit of those of maybe who haven't used it or aren't familiar with it. Um, essentially, AI-powered lead scoring is the practice of ranking leads uh, by propensity to convert into a paid customer by accessing a broad range of third-party data sets to find pockets of high-value audiences, right, using data that's not immediately accessible to you. Um, we find that our customers typically fall into one or two buckets. Um, many of you on the call might be falling into one of these two buckets as well, about 5% so the minority. Um, fall into the bucket of having too many leads, right? So we call it the curse of abundance. Um, they have too many leads to follow up on and again, need to prioritize their capacity and resources um, on those that have the highest likelihood to convert. So that's sort of bucket one. Uh, bucket two, which again, the bulk of our customers fall into is that 95% uh, that ha just have to rebuild trust with their sales teams due to inbound leads being low quality. And again, Kerry referred to this as, you know, sometimes our counterparts and SDR teams or sales teams can, can have a loud voice, right, and can be um, annoyed if some of the quality of the leads they're getting aren't, uh, aren't what they expect. Uh, and again, this can move you out of the circle of trust with your sales teams, right? Um, so AI-powered lead scoring can be an additive solution, again, I'm emphasizing that it's an enhancement to what you're already doing in your marketing automation platform to supercharge your lead scoring, right? Um, so that's that's how it fits in. And again, in terms of how it differs, um, in, in your marketing automation platform, you might have already set criteria, right? Based on engagement, um, fits. This can include maybe people that have attended webinars, uh, people that have clicked on emails or campaigns, uh, and maybe some basic firmographic criteria that you've collected and you know about your ideal customers, uh, such as industry or size. Uh, what AI-powered lead scoring can do uh, is augment this intelligence, right, by combing through over 20,000 different third-party uh, data attributes, which include technographic data, right? So are they using Azure? Are they using Salesforce? Uh, do they have specific types of software, right, that technographic data? Uh, in combination uh, with intent, so what are they browsing across uh, third-party websites? Does it, does it match up uh, with showing interest signals, as, as Kerry called it, related to your offerings? and deeper dive firmographic criteria that you might have not captured on a lead form, right? Maybe uh, employee growth um, or uh, revenue, right? Or employees, whatever you, you, is important to you, you can augment uh, the additional firmographic criteria to refine your, uh, refine your lead scoring. So the benefits of AI-driven lead scoring are really um, under two buckets of leads. So I just wanna take a moment to cover this, right? So let me explain. Um, if we think of the basic range of leads being sort of red, yellow, green leads, right? Just for, for simplicity's sake. Red leads are those that probably don't hit 
um, don't fit your fit criteria, right, that may have engaged in uh, maybe just a few interactions, right? So let's say this is a student, maybe they're looking for a job, they attend the webinar, they visit a couple of pages, uh, but they don't really fit your ideal customer profile, right? Um, the second category is yellow leads. So these could be ones that potentially fit your criteria, right? So there's a there's a loose match there uh, that have engaged with you. They've attended a couple of webinars. They've maybe clicked on a couple emails, um, but haven't taken action yet to raise their hands, right? They haven't explicitly said, call me, or I want to talk to a salesperson, right? Um, so let's say this is a good prospect that you've identified, but they haven't really filled in a form yet. Uh, green leads are the ones that have already raised their hands, right? They came to your page, they loved everything, uh, they submitted a form and say, I'm ready for a demo, right? Um, so where AI-powered lead scoring can help you um, is really your effectiveness on the red and the yellow, right? It can help materially reduce bad leads that are entering um, your, your sales follow-up sequences while also improving the scoring of these yellow leads um, that uh, that you're, you'll be more effectively be able to route to your sales teams um, in advance of them even you know, raising their hand or filling in a form. So you can capture and start to route some of these audiences as you've captured all the signals and you have a, a high degree of confidence they're a good fit. You can start routing those leads to your sales teams for follow-up as well. So um, let me show a quick example here of um, what AI-powered lead scoring can do in, in our um, ABM platform, right? So as a reminder, you know, market automation systems uh, can only focus sort of on engagement data, or what you assume or know to be a uh, firmographic fit of your audiences. Um, this lead scoring engine, again, I'm showing a screenshot of the product here, uh, can actually uh, take a look at pockets of audiences that are of high, high value by scanning 20,000 different attributes across technographic, intent or deeper dive firmographic criteria. Uh, and again, score them in real time for effective sales follow-up. So they're saving time focusing on their best leads. Uh, and you become the hero as the marketing or sales ops professional by getting them you know, the, the highest quality leads that are in your pipeline. Um, what we do to actually do this scoring is actually we take a look at your prior closed one deals in the past six months um, up to a year. So we take that data from you and we use it as a way to train the model, right? So when we take a look at that data of prior closed one deals, we're, we're identifying characteristics within those audiences based on tech data, intent data, um, and also firmographic data to find those pockets of high value audiences and are recommending different audience criteria that might fit um, for an A versus a B versus a C, right? And we give you the opportunity to kind of refine that. If you see something that's off, you can take it out and pull it back in. Uh, but it, this essentially, um, shows you on this screen right here where 6% of leads um, have a ranking of A for immediate sales follow-up, right? Your highest propensity that are going to convert to a closed opportunity. Um, and again, they're going to show you, uh, you know, a 9x predicted lift for this segment, right? Versus some of the other uh, ones that have been identified by the AI scoring model. So uh, you can start to now return some of your Cs and your Ds back to your nurture sequences, uh, or, you know, you can decide to potentially um, you know, uh, ignore them all together, right? If you're getting too many leads and you don't have capacity, you have to start to make a choice between what you follow up on and what you uh, what you deploy your sales sales team's resources on. So, uh, just wanted to give you an example of that. And once you're scored, once you've scored these audiences, you can start to immediately deploy them inside your CRM. Uh, this is a screenshot from a customer example that I've sort of redacted a little bit, uh, but you'll see that uh, that fit rating of A, B, C, D make its way directly into your CRM for your sales team to, um, to follow up on. And again, this is an additive solution that can enhance the effectiveness of what you're already doing in your, in your marketing automation platform. Um, so I wanted to just end with a, uh, with a customer example here. Uh, we recently worked with um, a digital agreement and signature company. They're a very well-recognized brand in this space. Um, they actually had too many leads uh, as a result of prom promoting a free trial as their primary CTA. Uh, this yielded about 90,000 leads that they were getting per quarter. Uh, they also have a low ASP, which made it a challenge to engage their best leads, right? So they had that curse of abundance, as I called it earlier. Uh, and their main measure of performance was improving conversion rates, uh, and they needed help in this area, right? So the customer was using Eloqua uh, to do some basic engagement and fit scoring already, uh, and they wanted to decrease uh, engagement on bad leads, right, uh, those, uh, those red leads, um, and also they wanted to um, increase focus on those um, yellow uh, yellow leads where, you know, they were, they haven't really filled in a form yet, uh, but they have been engaging with us a lot. And how can we start to route some of these leads to our, to our sales teams or SDR teams for follow-up? 
So they use the, um, the lattice predictive scoring uh, as a complement to their Eloqua scoring. Uh, and they were, they were able to associate some technographic and additional fit criteria to uh, supercharge their fit scoring. Um, so basically taking a look at, you know, is this company already using some of the technologies that we integrate with and we know that it's a good fit for us, right? Um, so this actually increased the accuracy, uh, which led to about 37% lift in their opportunity win rate. So their sellers were focused uh, about um, 3x more attention and time on these A leads, uh, which yielded uh, more opportunity wins, right? So they could sort of, um, you know, reprioritize all the other leads that they were getting uh, that didn't have a predictive lift of conversion uh, versus the ones that the scoring model identified as, yes, these are the ones that are going to give you a good lift. Um, and ultimately, this resulted in a 10% lift in their demand funnel yield, right? So they were able to get more out of the leads that they were getting by just sheer prioritization. And this is where AI-powered lead scoring can help you. Um, so before we take it over to, to q and I uh, just wanted to let everyone know that, you know, if you're attending this webinar, you do qualify for a pilot program if you want to test this out see if it uh, is a good fit for your business. We can also get started with a demonstration if you want to see how the solution works. Uh, just to recap the lead scoring engine, when again, we'll use these 20,000 different attributes and uh, in the demo we can cover whether some of these attributes are relevant to you or, or, or contain some of the signals that interest you, um, right, to kind of supercharge your lead scoring. Uh, in addition, we can also um, help you get started with a form fill solution if you're looking to, again, reduce some abandonment on the form, uh, get more leads in, and also reduce some of the bad data on the front end uh, that's making its way into your marketing automation platform. So um, with that, um, I'll turn it back um, for some Q&A. Awesome. Thanks, Dennis. Thanks, Carrie. I thought this was uh, perfect. We're, we're getting so many questions, and I think people, you know, a lot of B2B marketers that we talk to, are frustrated and kind of throw up their hands that, that you know this challenge is, is getting harder to fix but this is really practical examples i mean ai is not a thing in the future you can see how this can really uh, help this challenge today for a lot of people so i thought carrie really framed it uh and dennis provided some great real world applications i think everyone can take away so uh we're going to switch over q a as dennis said um go ahead and type in any questions if you haven't already we've got some great ones come in uh but we'll try to get to as many as we uh before we wrap up so um, let me look at some of the questions we got in. Um, Carrie, question for you. You know, if somebody, this is uh, Marsha asked, if we already have a predictive score, um, then why would we need uh, the, the old sort of marketing automation score? And you know, do you need both? I guess is her question. No, great, great question. It's one that uh, comes up still. It's been coming up for years. Uh, in an ideal world, yield, uh, world <laughs> you wouldn't. Uh, the predictive score really should do. The issue is when you're passing leads to uh, people, those people want to understand something about the person that they're about to call. They want to know what they were interested in and they need something to talk about. And that often is what comes from the marketing automation side of the score. So, you know, what were they looking at? Were they looking at a lot of content? And for uh, a BDR or sales rep to be emotionally engaged in, in having a great conversation with a prospect, they almost always want to know a lot about what that person was looking at so they can feel related to them. So it helps to do that. Now, ideally, if we were passing these off to robots or something, you wouldn't need that. Um, and the predictive score from the predictive model would really tell you what you ought to do. Uh, but it's just a real world consideration. So that's why we still see that pretty commonly happening. Okay, awesome. Uh, question for you, Dennis. Um, Patrick was, was following up on the, the case study example you just shared and asked what, what you know, with other customers, what type of buyer signals are they typically capturing and utilizing your, your platform for? Yeah, sure. Happy to answer that question. I alluded to it a couple of times during the presentation, but I'll reiterate it again. There's, again, like I said, there's 20,000 different attributes. I don't want to cover all of them, but they primarily fall into um, three buckets, right? So you can look at firmographic data as one, and, um, you know, this can be industry, size, revenue, growth, um, location, all that kind of information we can um, incorporate into the scoring engine. Intent is another one. So if you're looking at, you know, what kind of topics um, our customers or your prospects are browsing off your website, right? So they're on CNN.com or they're on TechCrunch or, you know, and what kind of content are they interacting with? And does that roll up to a category 
of solution that you offer, right? And that's a good signal as well uh, that we can incorporate. Um, and also technographic data is one that's very popular, right? So what kind of technologies do they have installed? What kind of software are they using? So are they using network management software, right? So are they using uh, Novell, EMC, SolarWinds? Um, and, you know, are they using consumer electronics technologies like Apple or Dell or Intel, right? So there's a lot of different technology products that we can also incorporate. If we've detected that signal and matches your customer criteria or prospect criteria, that makes its way into the model. And Awesome. All right, so, um, Carrie, another question. I'm going to steer this one to you. Um, this is from Paul. He said you know, there is a lot of different buying signals that he's trying to understand within his organization. Uh, ultimately, is there sort of like one buying signal that you think is sort of the, the, the most important? Kind of a trick question from <laughs> Paul, I think, a little bit. But um, it, probably the most important signal is that there's more than one signal. Uh, so if the only signal you have from a prospect is they came to your website and looked at content, that by itself, you know, the conversion rates are such that it, it, it's not a good signal. Less than half of 1% of those things for, are going to close and turn into something for most of you. So the most important signal is that there's more than one. So if there's two people from that organization or if there's a person plus an intent signal or a person plus anonymous traffic, um, we always want to know, is that person from an account that could buy something from you in the first place? So always adding a sort of ICP signal to that lead signal, always important. So uh, is there a single signal that's most important? Uh, no single signal, but the fact of there being more than one is probably the single most important thing to look at. Yeah, I really loved your, your analogy of did they bring friends. I mean, multiple buyers, it sounds like you really feel like is a uh a key differentiator, whether it's a one visitor or multiple. Yeah, you know, two, two pieces of data on that. Um, we just did a survey, uh, and the, in the survey, we asked people how, how big their buyers are, how big their buyer committees are that they sell to. 96% uh, uh, of people said that their buying committees three or more, and 66%, I think it was, or 67% said it's five or more. So you know, your buyers are multiple people. And then our, we've got other research that says that when those people are out in market looking, almost every one of them does some of their own research. Even the highest people in the organization do some of their own research, although they may not fill out your forms. So everybody's going out and looking at your content, they're on your website, they're looking, and the evidence of there being more than one of them has got to be probably the single most important thing that you could look at. Dennis, just, uh, if you could add on to that, are, are you, do you agree that it's something that you're seeing your clients really prioritize ICP and try to spot multiple buyers? Is that something you guys are helping people do within the platform? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I think, you know, the way that I think it is very simplest level, right? You have an understanding of what your ICP is, right? You right. know that customers in a specific geography or an industry and a profile are a good fit for you. Um, what we're seeing increasingly is doing less sort of assumptions on what's a good fit, letting the data do some of the analysis for you, right, to complement that ICP and find pockets of audiences that you didn't even know existed that could be a, uh, a good fit for you. And again, the way that we do this is by looking at that prior closed one data um, and using that as a way to train the AI model to find those similar audiences in your in your funnel. Okay. Uh, another question that's probably better for you, Dennis, was, was specifically in terms of applying, you know, solutions like yours that, that um, address, use AI to address some of these scoring things. How, how long does it, the, the, this take? Um, got the, the question from Donna, like, you know, to, to, in order to make this leap, how long does it typically take from what you've seen? Yeah, so again, it, it is entirely dependent on customer, but I'll give you just sort of a general sense of how we work uh, to give you a sense of how long it might take. Uh, the main input we need here, again, to get the lead scoring set up is that prior closed one data because we need to, we need some data set to help train the model and understand where you've had success. Uh, and again, like I mentioned, we, we look for anywhere for prior, you know, six months to a year of those closed one deals. Uh, and typically that can take some time to wrangle and get internally. Uh, maybe let's say, you know, that takes about a week or so. Um, we also present an opportunity for you to review some of the recommendations and segments that the that the model is is recommending uh, for input and refinement, right? So if you say, oh no, actually, you know, this this audience doesn't really look right or doesn't feel right, I want to change some of the criteria. We give you some of that option, uh, and let's say that takes another week or so. So we can be getting up and running in about a few weeks or so with this kind of solution. Okay, awesome. 
We had uh, one kind of big picture question that I think I'll end on uh, from Gina, and I want to get both of your perspectives on it. Um, I think it was seen, you know, she's asking a question about what is the biggest challenge and priority for both sales and marketing around lead scoring today? And I think for me, you know, was like we covered lead scoring for a number of days. Scoring was supposed to help sales and marketing get on the same page and, you know, agree which leads to follow up on. Has that changed from what you, you've seen? And is it sort of where, where do you think it sits today with both sales and marketing? Dennis, let me start with you and then we'll wrap up with Kerry. Sure. Yeah. I mean, the way that I see it, you know, the most common challenges that, that I encounter when working with customers is um, one of follow up time. And when I say time, like when, as soon as someone is engaging with you, you know, they're a good fit. Like how quickly can I get that to my best rep, the right rep uh, with the right context, right? So giving, getting that lead follow up engine cranking can be a challenge for a lot of our customers, um, especially when they've got different products that they're selling that go to different sales teams that have different contexts and different customer requirements, right? So wrangling that complexity is a big challenge. Um, I would say personalizing um, good follow-up is also a big challenge that I'm seeing. So as we're being more and more data-driven, there's a there's a desire to have all these different segments that are really robust and built, but having the right context and personalizing that follow-up can be a challenge with good uh, good content, right? And, and, and good context for your salespeople. And again, you know, one of the main ones that's always a challenge is measurement of performance, right? So what I'm doing today, is that meaningfully you know, different than this new solution that I'm evaluating? And that's one of the things that we take very seriously whenever we're working with a customer is doing that pilot, proving success before you kind of broaden out and, and sort of try to boil the ocean with a solution like this, right? So that's, that's also something that we're seeing a lot. Yeah, those are great points. Kerry, anything you'd add in terms of how you've seen the changes, challenges change for, for sales and marketing? Yeah, everything that, uh, that Dennis said, uh, spot on. And then I'll just come back to the idea of the, the buying group or buying committee. Your buyer is multiple people. They're out looking at your content and other folks' content. You value that signal when it comes in the form of third party intent, which is a group level signal. Are there you know, individuals in that organization looking? So you got to do it uh, on your own. Uh, you've got to look at multiple signals uh, and see if those folks are in, in market. Uh, and that's what's going to distinguish the tire kickers from the folks who are really buyers. All right. On that, I think we will wrap up. I want to you know, thank you both for outstanding content. I think this really nailed it. And, uh, you know, again, I've covered this for a long time. I, I think this is really practical and actionable. For So I'm hoping a lot of people tune in and take advantage of this. I know we had a lot of registrants for it. Um, also, good resources within the platform here. Grab those, you know, as follow-up, share them with your team uh, and review, and also the the offer for the free pilot. I would, I would definitely recommend folks take advantage of that so you can get in and see how this might apply within your unique go-to-market strategy. So, uh, again, thanks to Dennis. Thanks to Kerry uh, for the great content. I want to thank you all for attending. A couple of quick reminders uh, to, to wrap up. Um, the session has been recorded. You'll get all the registrants will get a link to go back and review. Uh, also share it with your peers. Uh, but anything you miss, you can go back and check on, but uh, pass it along to your team as well. So thanks again to Carrie and Dennis, and thank you all for attending, and we will hopefully see you on a, a webinar soon. Have a good day, everybody. Thanks, everybody.